So hello everyone. Um, I would like to start by thanking Mettler Toledo for the opportunity to present for this live webinar. Um, I've very much enjoyed um, our collaborations with Mettler Toledo. Their instruments continue to be a critical tool in a lot of the research that takes place at Dow Chemical. Um, so just to start by giving folks a little background on my work, uh, I'm currently in the analytical sciences group at Dow Chemical at our Collegeville site in Pennsylvania. Um, I specialize in projects using IR and Raman spectroscopy, uh, mostly for macromolecular characterization for polymer materials. Um, a lot of work at Dow has gone into using in situ spectroscopy for monitoring lab and process chemistry, which I'll mention briefly today, but uh, I am going to focus on another application uh, focused using um, online IR and Raman spectroscopy to analyze compositions for polymer separations. So some folks uh, may have tuned in to another webinar series last fall where my colleague Sean Chen presented um, on some of the benefits of using in situ spectroscopy in chemical industry. So I wanted to mention this topic quickly before moving on to talk about polymer separations, um, since it is a very important part of the work we focus on at Dow. Uh, in situ IR and Raman instruments such as the REACT IR system shown here um, are currently used in Dow for both lab discovery and process chemistry, and all the way up to the plant production scale. Uh, the choice between iron and Raman is typically based on which functional groups we might be interested in, which some of the common ones for the polymer materials we looked at are listed here. Um, we've seen incredible benefits in terms of optimizing reactions and process design by using these instruments to monitor reaction composition. Um, including unstable intermediates in real time um, without additional time commitments um, needed for sample uh, preparation. Another great advantage of these in-situ instruments is their ability to be leveraged across multiple sites, um, so they're highly portable. So especially during this time, um, during the pandemic, we've still been able to share these instruments between different projects that have been occurring at our various R&D sites. Um, specifically, you know, we, we do a lot of sharing between our three main sites in North America, um, in uh, Lake Jackson and Midland, Michigan, and Collegeville, Pennsylvania. So while there's been a lot of ongoing work on in situ reaction monitoring by IR and Raman, another area of interest in characterizing polymer materials is compositional analysis of polymer separations. So for many complex copolymers, their performance and properties are often dependent on the type of polymer chains present, their size and molecular weight distributions, as well as interactions between polymer chains, chain length, and other characteristics. The many different types of separation experiments, such as GPC and SEC, uh, these all can help us understand correlations between the performance of many polymer materials and their molecular structures and weights. There's a recent paper from folks at Dow um, that is a great reference for recent advances in polymer characterization for separation-based techniques. I would definitely suggest checking it out if you would like to learn more. An important part of these separations experiments is the detectors that are used to analyze what's coming off the column, though. So some of the common detection techniques include measuring refractive index, which is measuring the bending of light by a sample compared to a reference, light scattering, which can be useful for detecting compounds that are not efficiently absorbed um, by another common detector, which is UV vis absorbance. Uh, these detectors often work well for characterizing the bulk property of the material in the case of RI or a selective chemical property in the case of light scattering or UV vis. However, not every component will always give a strong light scattering or UV signal. And in, ad in addition, these standard detection techniques don't generally provide us with information on the molecular structure and composition of the components that are eluding from the column. So uh, there's definitely a need um, for additional analysis to look at the compositional heterogeneity of polymers um, at various molecular weights. So for example, we do need other detectors and techniques that can track the distribution of monomer incorporation to copolymers, so this can be pretty important um, for a lot of our materials, as well as distribution of polymer chain links. Um, and this additional compositional information will really help us understand uh, the correlation between the copolymer structure um, and composition, and also its properties such as um, miscibility. 
um, optical properties and rheology. Um, also understanding, you know, how the average composition of polymer is changing across the molecular weight distribution. Uh, that's that can be really important for some of our projects that focus more on understanding um, the mechanisms for polymerization um, for different products. Uh, so that's that's another factor in here. Spectroscopic techniques can help address some of these composition questions for complex polymer distributions. Mass spectrometry is definitely the most common to be coupled with chromatography, um, and it's a highly selective and sensitive technique for finding information on polymer mass and end group distributions. Some of its limitations um, can include limits in mass range for some of the conventional LCMS techniques, so it can be limited to, to polar and small polymers. It's a pretty fast analysis time and provides unique mass spectra, but these can be complex and difficult to interpret. Um, and quantification of components on the column can also be challenging. Mass spec also can't differentiate, differentiate between structural isomers, and it may not be the best option for getting clear information on functional group contributions. NMR has also been coupled with separations experiments, and it's another powerful technique for getting structural information for polymers in solution. Its use with separation experiments dates back to the 1980s, and it started to become more popular in analytical labs in the 90s. Its major drawback is low sensitivity, particularly when compared to mass spec. And again, overlapping NMR signals can make analysis of spectra challenging. Another drawback for both NMR and mass spec is that these systems are generally not portable. So that can count against them for their ease of use and coupling with different separation techniques. IR and Raman are, of course, the main detectors that I've focused on in my own work. And IR in particular has been a popular technique for coupling with separations. There are also some examples of using Raman spectroscopy, although much fewer than IR. Similar to NMR, sensitivity and the complexity in both the IR and Raman spectra can be a problem. However, IR and Raman are great for functional group analysis and uh, identification of organic compounds. They can be much more portable than, for example, NMR or mass spec. Uh, so to give an idea of some of the challenges and, and considerations for, for coupling either IR or Raman spectroscopy to a separation experiment, um, I want to focus on giving an example of GPC separations, where we're specifically looking at the composition of polymers with uh, different molecular weight distributions. So in the example of a copolymer with two components um, shown here, where maybe you're isolating peaks that correspond to two functional groups, such as a carbonyl or a silicon bond, um, you can use those individual contributions to the spectrum to map out a ratio between the two components and track how that changes as you move from high to low molecular weight species in your um, column or in your separation experiment. The choice between IR and Raman um, is highly de dependent on what functional group you're trying to isolate. So I mentioned this a little bit when I talked about the in situ work. Um, but, you know, for example, you know, you want to make sure you're picking one that gives you the strongest signal for, for if it's a carbonyl or silicone, for example, IR might be the best option for that since you'll get a very strong signal. Um, you also want to consider, you know, differences in sensitivity between the two techniques based on your experimental setup, um, as well as the potential for fluorescence. In the case of Raman, that can be a problem. Um, what solvent you are using is very important. Um, so for example, if you are gonna do an aqueous separation, um, Raman might have a distinct advantage over IR just because water absorbs so strongly in the IR. Um, I mentioned on our previous slides, the main concerns for both I and Raman um, are that we are working with dilute polymer. Um, so all of these separation experiments require significant dilution. And the solvents here, um, are can be chemically similar to polymers um, in order to improve their solubility. Um, so a lot of times we're seeing significant interference from the mobile phase for um, these types of experiments. Um, and while it may be tempting, you know, to pick solvents with fewer peak interference, there's that solubility issue where you often need that a solvent that's more chemically similar. So I'm showing here an example of spectra collected for a separation experiment aimed at analyzing a mixture of polymethacrylate or PMMA um, and polystyrene uh, up top here in THF solvent. I'm showing specifically Raman spectra, but you can do the same analysis for IR as well. 
the overlay of each of these shows in blue the pure spectrum of uh, the pure solvent spectrum of THF, and then the dilute polymer spectrum of either PMMA or polystyrene in THF. In red above the overlay is the solvent subtracted spectrum where we remove the contributions of THF. So we can see here um, that the polystyrene actually has a much stronger signal in the Raman compared to PMMA. For example, the peak at around 1,000 wave numbers related to the aromatic group is very visible. Uh, PMA has, PMMA has a much lower signal intensity uh, for, for all of the peaks that are visible in the Raman. While I didn't show the IR here, you actually get the reverse situation, though, um, with PMMA having a very strong carbonyl signal in the IR around 1734 wave numbers, which is barely detected here in the Raman. In addition, those strong polystyrene peaks we see in the Raman are much weaker in the IR as well. But if we look at the actual um, separation experiment, so here we're um, tracking the peaks for PMMA and polystyrene during the GPC separation, the chromatograms um, for different injection volumes are shown here on the right. Um, so PMMA is uh, at a higher molecular weight, so that elutes first off the column around seven minutes. Um, and as expected, we see much more signal in the IR tracking that carbonyl group compared to what we see with what's eluting off of at seven minutes in the Raman spectra. Um, uh, and the polystyrene is the second species that eludes from the column. And we actually are only able to see um, the significant contributions from the polystyrene when we track the aromatic groups that are in the Raman spectra. Um, so in the IR, um, we're actually not seeing much signal for, for the peaks that we picked um, to track here. Um, for anyone who might be more familiar with polystyrene and its IR spectrum, it does actually have a very strong peak around 700 wave numbers. Uh, but unfortunately, um, this was actually out of the range of the, the, or out of the spectral range that was being used for the instruments here. So, you know, that's just highlights um, kind of the importance of having a wider spectral range when analyzing these components. There's a lot of examples in the literature of tracking that 700 wave number um, peak for polystyrene successfully using IR. Um, and again, I mentioned the graphs show three different injection masses. So what's important to consider is that you want to have a balance between how much you load onto the column to improve your sensitivity um, and how that might affect your separation re resolution. So if you notice here on the left for the IR and the Raman signals, um, you definitely get a boost in signal um, as you go to higher injection masses on your column. Um, however, you know, you lose some of that separation resolution. So you can see here from green to blue, which is the highest injection mass, um, you start to see um, kind of less separation between those two peaks. So you really need to choose a balance between those, uh, those different experimental parameters. Uh, so this slide shows that same effect I was mentioning with the injection mass, but this is for a little bit more complex polymer separation case. Um, so this is a case, we were actually starting with a fairly high concentration here for the samples, um, which is why in, in this case you can see um, that that resolution or that separation resolution between the different species in here really breaks down um, at as low as 25 microliters um, of injection volume here. So, uh, and I think uh, the other important observation here um, for, for this particular separation experiment is that um, we're seeing, even at the highest uh, injection volume, so as you move between 75 and 100 microliters, um, not only are you losing your separation, but you're not getting any additional benefit um, in your sensitivity for IR um, or Raman in this case. So you actually are seeing a, you know, a saturated column um, so you really want to, you know, kind of optimize this ahead of time to figure out where your best signal is going to be with your best separation um, for the separation experiment. Another factor to consider um, with coupling IR and Raman um, to these separation experiments is your instrument parameters. So, for example, acquisition time. Um, can be pretty important for your data quality. So shown here is IR data for a GPC separation in THF again. 
Um, and this is another complex polymer. We're tracking um, a variety of peaks for two polymer components that I've noted as A and B here. Um, so the left shows the IR uh, using a 15 second acquisition time during the experiment um, compared to on the right, the shorter acquisition time of, of five seconds. Um, so a couple of things to notice here. Um, one um, unrelated to the acquisition time is a negative peak intensity for the gray trace, which is um, one of the peaks that um, was selected for component A. So this just gives you an example of um, some peak interference uh, where clearly um, in that region you actually, um, and if I, you know, if I showed you the spectra you could see more clearly, but uh, there's peak interference between the A and B signals in that region. So you know, that is probably not the best peak for us to focus on when we're trying to get composition ratios and that kind of thing. Um, um, we can also see, so for the shorter acquisition times, um, if you compare the gray and the blue traces um, to what we see on the left for the longer acquisition times, we're definitely looking at um, a little bit more noise uh, in the baseline here for the shorter acquisition times. But the benefit you get, you can really clearly see in the orange trace for, for one of the peaks for component A, which eludes off the column first. Um, and so for that, um, for that shorter acquisition time, we're getting a much more well-defined peak shape over the course of that separation. Um, so, and that can really help you, you know, we can see maybe if there's composition changes between this first section of the curve coming off um, for the high molecular weight species around seven minutes, and then, you know, just after eight minutes, um, if there's a composition change here for that higher molecular weight um, distribution for this component. So, you know, more, more data points is probably going to give you a more accurate estimate of how those composition ratios are changing. Another important parameter is flow rate. Uh, and actually changing the flow rate on the column gives you a pretty similar result to changing the acquisition time. You can see in this GPC separation, we changed the flow rate for the same separation uh, from one mil per minute to half a mil per minute which gives us a lot more data points for tracking, in this case, uh, the Raman intensity of two components of interest. You'll notice too that we are not really seeing any spectral signal for a third component that eludes off this column. We can only really focus on the composition analysis for the first two species using IR and Raman. Another important thing to note, the peak broadening observed between the two flow rates shown here is really just because of the longer separation time Really, we should be graphing on the x-axis x-axis the total volume eluded from the column to compare these two flow rates rather than time as, we show, as we've shown here. But the important thing is that using a lower flow rate gives us a much more detailed peak shape, particularly in the case of the high molecular weight species. So this yellow trace, um, or yellow, uh, sorry, yellow shaded section that eludes from the column first. I've zoomed in on these data points in the figure on the right side in order to show how we can calculate the change in composition ratio for this peak in two areas of higher and lower molecular weights indicated by the, the shaded red and blue zones. Uh, so this is really important for helping us uh, determine the comp how the composition ratio is changing and you know, help us draw conclusions about relationships between composition structure and the polymer performance. So I've talked a bit about acquisition times, injection mass, and flow rates, and there's definitely more parameters you can change around besides those. But hopefully this gives a quick, quick glimpse of how some of these different experimental conditions affect the quality of data collected by either IR or Raman as you try to work through optimizing your separation experiment. So as I mentioned before, there have been a lot of studies coupling IR and fewer studies coupling Raman to separation experiments. And there's a fair amount of companies that have worked on developing commercial instruments for coupling specifically IR with separations. The main goals of these instruments is to try and address these primary challenges that I've mentioned already of solvent interference and low concentration due to dilution on the column. While I've been focusing on online analysis, offline analysis is always an option um, where you can collect individual fractions from the column and this gives you the flexibility to then evaporate off solvent or concentrate the sample down before measuring it. But this can be pretty time consuming and often will not give you the adequate separation resolution or the opportunity for quantification. 
Solvent removal is another popular strategy for an online technique. This technique focuses on normally using a small scale sp spray dryer that gives you a dried solute deposited on a disc that can rotate and be analyzed continuously by IR without the solvent interference. You can be limited in switching to different solvents using this approach. If anything becomes clogged or contaminated in the spray dryer, you may lose your opportunity to, to get any kind of quantitative analysis. Another strategy is, is using spectral analysis methods to subtract out the solvent contributions. This is often used with flow cells where the column flows directly to the to IR or Raman detector. In this case, it may be easier to switch between solvents since the flow cell can be removed and cleaned easier, but you also may need higher injection masses on your column in order to overcome interference issues with the solvent and get decent signal to noise. To give you an idea of how the online methods compare for the flow cell system and solvent removal, I want to show a more detailed comparison of two commercially available systems, which we've also used for polymer separation analysis for polymer materials. The, the IR5 and IR6 instruments are an example of using a, a flow cell system. So they have a heated flow cell and have been used extensively in the detection of polyolefins, such as all types of polyethylene and polypropylene components that are common to Dow um, with our materials. Their instrument is quite sensitive and stable, um, but it can only analyze fixed wavelengths, which is definitely a drawback. However, with the right polymer composition, the results can be pretty quantitative. The bottom left figure shows an example of a polyethylene polymer blend um, where the line in red indicates how they were actually able to map weight percent of vinyl acetate in the polymer based on selecting the carbonyl band across uh, the molecular weight distribution. On the other hand, Discover IR from Spectra Analysis is an example of a commercial online IR detector that focuses on solvent removal where the eluent from the column is actually deposited on a disk from which time-ordered IR spectra are measured. I mentioned before switching between solvents can introduce problems here and quantitative analysis might not be as robust. I haven't focused on data collection time very much, but there also is a time limit here for how long you can continuously collect data based on how much room you have on the disk, although it is designed to fit in several hours of data collection. So I want to focus a bit more on each of these commercially available instruments to give you a little more detail. Uh, there were actually three versions currently available from um, Polymer Car with the IR4, 5, and 6. The IR4 uh, was actually the first one they had that expanded the analysis from just CH bands to ester carbonyls. The latest version of the IR6 has the ability to analyze those carbonyl bands at 1740 wave numbers. Um, but also has improvements to the sensitivity for the CH range that was accomplished in the earlier IR5 version. Um, these instruments are all great options for analyzing polyolefins, such as the ones that you know, I've listed at the top of this slide. Typically, these experiments use uh, either trichlorobenzene or orthodichlorobenzene for the mobile phase as solvents, and, and these don't have any bands that interfere with the fixed wavelengths that are used in this analysis. Again, though, the fixed wavelength approach is a huge limitation, and those solvents are not going to work for a lot of different materials. So you're really limiting the range of samples that can be analyzed, and certain polymer mater materials just won't work here. Uh, but again, great sensitivity for the polyolefins it does work on, including uh, looking at polymer chain branching by analyzing signals from methyl and methylene groups specifically. They also have good sensitivity for lower injection masses, which is a challenge for flow cells, but limiting the solvents used, and in this case, um, the one that's shown on the slide in the bottom right, they're using a standard with a pretty narrow distribution. So both of those things give them a bit of a step up on their limit of detection here. For the Discover IAR instrument, we've also used that um, extensively at Dow for analyzing polymers. Um, and it has some improved capabilities relative to what I mentioned for the IR6 in terms of the range of solvents um, and analyzing different wavelengths. Um, and this is in part um, so because it works by removing the solvent. So um, it works by nebulizing and desolvating the eluent from the column, which is then cooled and deposited on an IR transparent zinc selenide disk, and that's analyzed in real time. 
Um, so the advantage over an instrument like the IR6 um, is that it's definitely compatible with a lot more uh, chromatography solvents. Uh, however, you know, it's, it's also not a portable system, so there's a lot of time and effort that can go into switching between those solvents um, in terms of, you know, making sure everything is, is clean and if you have to switch columns and that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, some of the other benefits, it's, you know, had great sensitiv sensitivity, um, minimal peak broadening, um, so some good spatial resolution there between, you know, looking at a few seconds in the separation, you can get decent spectra. Uh, but, you know, it does take a lot of time to optimize um, the, the separation before you get usable data here. Um, another benefit um, that you could do with, with this technique is, um, analysis using a Raman microscope. So you can imagine if you're using the Discover IR for the deposition, you could analyze um, the deposition with a Raman microscope as well. And um, the IR6, so, you know, I mentioned the Raman can be coupled with, you know, kind of a Discover, Discover IR deposition experiment. Um, there's also lots of examples of Raman detection with flow cells. You know, the IR6 is specifically for IR but other examples in the literature have shown flow cell setups. So I'm showing you an example of a setup with a Raman microscope here and a flow cell um, where they were actually using a capillary based flow cell that's shown in, in the picture in the middle here. Um, so Raman has you know, definitely been an attractive alternative um, for looking at proteins in aqueous buffer. Um, so, the, you know, there's definitely a lot of success stories on that, um, where since water doesn't have significant spectral interference in the ramen. Um, but there's been some challenges um, for using organic solvents. So, you know, the same study that was looking at aqueous buffer for proteins also looked at polystyrene and THF, um, which you'll remember was an example I was showing earlier. And they struggled here with um, looking at uh, getting a good detection of the polystyrene peaks in the ramen um, above the THF signal. Um, so their solvent subtraction here was definitely um, a challenge. And so, um, and they were using a pretty typical GPC injection mass around 50 micrograms. Um, so there's definitely, definitely improvements that could be made here in terms of, you know, getting a little bit better signal here off of the polystyrene. But. So to summarize um, for our online methods, you know, I've been trying to kind of focus on some of the benefits and drawbacks of the flow cell um, versus, you know, the solvent elimination methods with the flow cell being, you know, the IR6 is a great example of that and the solvent elimination Discover IR is a good example of that. Um, so uh, this table provides a nice comparison of those benefits and drawbacks. Uh, some of which I've, I've gone into more detail for. So um, for gradient separations where your mobile, mobile phase changes um, in composition during the separation experiment, um, you definitely have a benefit by removing the solvent, um, much easier to analyze the data. Whereas for a flow cell um, where the solvent is still present, you know, you're not gonna be able to subtract out that solvent as easily when the composition is changing. Um, Qualitative information a lot of times is easier with the um, in the case of a solvent elimination technique um, since you can have so much interference from the mobile phase in the flow cell situation. Um, but in terms of quantitative analysis, if you are able to see um, distinct peaks using the flow cell method, it's going to be much easier um, to get quantitative data that way. Um, in terms of sensitivity, um, signal to noise, and limited detection. Most of the time, um, the solvent elimination technique wins out over the flow cell. Um, but for ease of operation, um, I think flow cell is generally provides a lot of benefits. So it's a bit more user friendly. Um, it can be more portable between you know, different separation experiments. Um, whereas solvent elimination, a lot of times, you know, has, has more time consuming optimization and, and you know, switching between different solvents and stuff can be, can be time consuming. Um, so I hope that I've given you all an idea of the challenges and the potential benefits um, of using online IR and Raman spectroscopy methods coupled with separation experiments and how this gives us better characterization in the case of polymer chemistry. Um, the, you know, there's a lot of choices and optimizations that go into these experiments. Um, 
and a lot of that revolves around addressing those primary challenges of sensitivity um, and solvent interference um, due to that dilution with the mobile phase. Um, and you know, the, your choice of solvent, um, injection mass, flow rate, acquisition time, all of those need to be considered and you know, kind of strike a balance um, in order to get the best results with either IR or Raman. Um, and then, you know, there's there's definitely choices for for commercially available options as well. Um, so I mentioned, you know, kind of the the Discover IR and the IR six are, are two instruments that, you know, we've used that you know have had some success, um, and are examples of either a flow cell or solvent removal type uh, method. Um, but there's definitely, most importantly, I think there's there's a lot of work that can still be done here. So areas of improvement. Um, especially for those commercial options I mentioned. Um, so, you know, improving sensitivity is always a goal, um, and it would be really important to improve sensitivity for, for quantification using flow cells. Um, I think there's also a lot more work that can be done in the area of Raman spectroscopy. So, so far, it has not a, attracted as much attention as using IR analysis with separations. Um, but I think it's an underutilized um, technique at this point, and you know there's definitely some analyses that could benefit from from a Raman coupled with with a GPC or or other separation. Um, uh, I mentioned a little bit how you know you really want to have the widest spectral range possible and the best solvent compatibility, so there's room for improvement there. Um, and you know there's also room for improvement in terms of the ease of use and portability. So. I think there's a huge benefit to having a portable system um, that can be moved between labs or easily cleaned and transitioned between columns um, and different solvents. So that you know is a definite advantage and something that you know commercial systems could work on in the future. Um, so uh, with that, I want to thank uh, my other colleagues at Dow who are also involved in this work um, that couples polymer separations with IR and Raman spectroscopy. Um, and I want to thank our collaborators at Mettler Toledo in particular um, for all the support we've received, um, uh, specifically Peter and Veronica and their team have just been absolutely great. Um, so thanks again. Um, and thanks again to all of you for your attention. Um, I would be happy um, to take any questions with the time we have left.